There's a lot of places I can't go. There's a lot of things I can't do. I can't go in the freezer without gloves on. Um, I ask other people to do things for me that I can't do. I don't go into really cold AC environments. If I have to go there, if it's like doctor's office or something that requires me to be there, I make sure I have scarves. I have uh, headbands that cover my ears. I have tubes of mostly ski, ski and polar kind of gear that's made for keeping people warm. As I learned more about what cryo actually means, that I have to keep myself warm, scarves became like a huge way that I did that. I tried Muslim hijabs. I have like, I literally, I think I counted, I have close to a hundred scarves. The simplified reasoning is that I have an autoimmune disease and that an autoimmune disease means the body doesn't take care of itself in the way that other people's does. It fights its own system. When I'm below body temperature, which is anything below 98.6, it means that my blood is my own worst enemy at those times. And that means anywhere blood goes, there can be damage. I've flared probably like three or four times in the last three or four weeks. I've just been kind of paying attention to it. Um, if I don't recover in two days from a flare, then it's kind of like, okay, well, we really need to think about chemo. I flared on Saturday in a way that was kind of new. I had on a metal necklace that I, I've been wearing around the clock for three years. And so I've never had a reaction to the metal necklace, but I was in San Francisco my friend and I went to see a concert. All of a sudden, I felt this pain in the back of my neck, and the next day I had just a nice little row of ulcers related to my necklace. It's about energy conservation for me. It's about managing my stamina, managing my fatigue, managing my pain. But those are all sort of, at this point, second nature and built into the way that I live. So I don't think about living with cryo on a daily basis. It's not part of my thought process, but it's kind of a job. And I have a little bit of distance from it in some ways. I treat this body as just a method to be here and take care of it as best I can. Cryo is short for cryoglobulin anemia, and it's an um, autoimmune disease. And it can, it's a, um, a disorder where if you get too cold, the blood agglutinates. And um, because it's agglutinating, the blood doesn't flow very well. So it can cause vasculitis or inflammation. And it can cause um, problems anywhere in the body. What it translates to is that the type 1 cryoglobulin is usually associated with people who have a malignancy, a cancer of antibody producing cells of um, usually of plasma cells. I think it can happen with lymphoma as well. And that's a little bit different. Those patients tend to have extremely high levels of cryoglobulin. Sometimes it doesn't even really form vasculitis. It's more clogging of vessels in, the, in cold extremities. Uh, but sometimes it's actually vasculitis. Cryo is unusual because it's clearly an immune mediated disease, but it sometimes is autoimmune and sometimes it represents immunity to uh, chronic infection. Autoimmunity means that the um, that the body's uh, immune system is attacking itself rather than some foreign organism. So the immune system is obviously designed to take care of infections and sometimes it malfunctions in very specific ways and attacks particular tissues. Cryoglobulins are immune complexes. They're very, very large ones and that's why they have the chemical property that they do of just falling out of solution in the cold in the laboratory. Um, but immune complexes tend to stick in small blood vessels. They, they stick to the um, the cells of the microvasculature, and sometimes that process tips over to cause inflammation. So the white blood cells come in, they damage the vessel, they damage the surrounding tissue, and um, in, in different organ systems, that's responsible for all of the different symptoms. When you ascribe hindsight to it, it's very easy to see that more of my injuries were in the winter. But living in the Bay Area where winter and seasonal stuff isn't that distinct, it wasn't perfectly winter, so it wasn't that easy of a pattern to identify. 
Sports was a big part of my life. I did gymnastics from the time I was like three till 12. I did volleyball, I did basketball, I swam, um, I water skied, very active physically. She was always very athletic, but she would seem like she was always getting hurt a lot. Um, and you know, we don't know why, but it just, it, it did seem like a lot of time that she was hurt a lot. It was tough to not be able to say something was wrong with me and be accepted for that. But I had no concept of a disability or a chronic illness or any of those things. When you're young, you don't think that way. You just think I can't or I can. And through all of that time period, my mother was always very supportive. When I told her I was tired, when I told her I hurt and I didn't know why, and we couldn't articulate about those things, she always believed me. One time I picked her up from school and in the process of coming down the staircase at school, she was pushed and um, she hurt her other ankle. I took her to the orthopedic, um, but he said, nobody has two broken ankles. And he said, I said, I think she does. And he said, well, you know, you know, with broken bones with Eileen, you, could, you got two, three days to settle. And um, so he said, come back if you think it's broken. And we came back the next day and he x-rayed it and sure enough, it was broken. She seemed to just plow through them, sort of plug along as when she was a kid. Um, it didn't seem to stop her from doing much aside from when she was too injured to do things, you know. Um, I went away to school at California State University, Sacramento. Um, originally went away to that school because I was going to play volleyball. But in the summer between high school and college, I injured my knee and I wasn't able to, I never even got to start. And that was the whole reason I picked that school was so that I could play volleyball there. In high school, I took sign language as a foreign language. And so I continued with that at Sac State. And I also continued with that at night classes at American River College. So all along this time period, my hands are a very key part of my social life, part of my learning life, part of my work life. Um, I was started working as an interpreter for pay by the time I was a sophomore in college. So my hands were important, but as part of my disease, the blood flow to the periphery, the furthest out parts of your body, your face, your feet, and your hands, those are the places that suffer first. So I had really painful hands, and it was always told to me like, oh yeah, repetitive strain injuries or things like that, and it, it wasn't true. It was a passion. I mean, it was, it, it had, it, had such a profound effect on her and on her values and on what she wanted to do. She's always had a very strong desire to um, help others and also I think that um, her strong drive has often been channeled into, into justice for others. But Eileen was my friend, uh, uh, the first friend that I ever met when I came to California. I came from Philadelphia. Um, I was escaping from gangs, and she was the first person I met. I mean, she was energetic, she was enthusiastic, her American Sign Language skills were top notch. She was very, very. Uh, she was a certified interpreter. She was working with deaf, deaf blind people. Um, she was working with other disabled rights access, like, you know, but then she'd have an off day and she just couldn't help people. And she had to like watch a movie. She just kind of couldn't interact with people at the same level. like. I mean, that's how her life seemed then. It was on off. When I graduated from college, the first, I worked for a year and then I ended up seeing the rheumatologist who is still my rheumatologist. And he told me I had scleroderma and told me that I probably wouldn't live that long um, 
three to five years. And that was petrifying for me. And I also really wasn't sure what that meant. And then nothing happened. I didn't change in the way that they did tell me things would happen. But I still hurt and I still kept waiting for the bad things to come. Ironically, I went to Women's Wellness in 1997 up in the snow um, in the Northern California hills. I was with family. I was with my grandmother. I was with my mom. I was with a couple of my aunts, cousins. And uh, I was walking down the corridor after dinner. There was snow on the ground. It had snowed that day. It was very, very cold. And I felt disconnected from the world. I felt like things sounded far away. And then I kind of lose track, and I'm not 100% sure of what happens next, but I end up communicating to my mom that I need to, something needs to happen. I need, I need help. And my aunt and my mom take me to the hospital. And when we got there, the doctors couldn't figure out how to get her blood, her temperature right, to rise. And the nurse came to me and said, you need to say goodbye to her because um, we, can't, we can't get her body temperature up. I said, okay. And then I went in and the orderly was getting warm blankets. She, she came to me and she says, you've been through this a lot. She says, you should react differently. And I said, she'll come through it. I know she'll come through it. And I remember very, very clearly this sort of, what I guess is probably a near-death experience of seeing my brother's plane and wanting to go towards them to play. And I kind of consciously chose, or felt like I chose, to go play with them. And I apparently told my mom really shortly after that experience, when I came back to being on the way to living, I guess, I told her that, you know, I had seen my brothers and that I felt like I should play with them. So that led to my diagnosis of cryoglobulinemia. I think it took me a couple of years to understand what cryo was. Um, because the definition of cold isn't what normally you think of as cold. It's it can be anything below 98.6 body temperature. So I didn't, I didn't grasp it for a while. I didn't know how to protect myself from things that would happen. And after my diagnosis, the next five years were just one major medical event after another. In November of 97, I had the heart incident that led to my diagnosis. And in March of 98, my brother died. So watching my parents lose a kid and having just come out of being diagnosed with one terminal illness and told I have a illness that could kill me, I was determined to not let my parents lose a second kid. And that is still a huge motivation in my heart and my mind. And it's also a huge motivation for me to protect my brothers from losing another sibling. So I'm motivated by the loss of my brother because I don't want to see that pain repeated in my family. I'm always amazed at Eileen because she is, no matter, I mean, it's not that she doesn't complain. I mean, there are times when she complains and the, the, she's upset and things are, are hard for her, but she always comes back to, but I could be worse off. Many, many people die from cryo, but something changed in me with that experience of my heart stopping up in the snow, and I was determined to do things differently. I was going to take care of myself. I was going to sleep well, eat well, take care of everything I could about the body that I had. So I started getting plasmapheresis in... January of 99 and continued that right on through till 2006, 2007, going to the hospital two to three days per week. It essentially removes all of the plasma 
and gives you donated plasma. So what they do is they put a needle into your arm. You have to have a special access built surgically in your arm. It's called a fistula to pump the blood out and then it goes through the machine. They pull off the plasma. They give you donated plasma. They spin the blood back together. They heat it up and it goes back into your body. You know, people always ask, like, how do you do it? It's like, you have to do it because if you don't go there, you have a hard time breathing. If you don't go there, you've got blood clots in your head or your neck or, you know, so it's just like showing up for keeping your life alive. So you just do it. Having had things in a way where I was physically strong and physically well and physically confident with my body to having, you know, gain lots of weight from the steroids to being sick from the chemo to having this ugly vein in my arm to everything it was pretty hard for me you know I felt like I felt kind of like a freak it's become clear recently that a drug called rituximab which is um a, a uh, an artificially created monoclonal antibody that binds to B cells and depletes them, gets rid of them. Um, that has emerged as the real standard of care for people with severe cryoglobinemic vasculitis. I was just like fascinated by the fact that scientifically they'd gotten to this point that they could even try to do something. I don't think anybody's ever been so excited to go to chemotherapy, you know. <laughs> I just was like, okay, let's go. It, I felt like I won the lottery because I didn't have to go two to three times a week to the hospital. All he can do to not pull. Montana is my service dog, and he's uh, an American Labradoodle. He comes from a program where he, they were bred for service work and then trained by trainers specifically for an individual person. So he was trained specifically Drop for it. me. And he's the most joyful, fun, exciting, and helpful thing in my life. He get the phone, he can seek for he can see help for me. He also alerts me to when I start to have cryo problems and I'm not necessarily always able to catch those things. He's my early warning system. Settle. Settle. Alright Tana, check me. Check me. Yep, I have one right there. Good boy. Basically, it's specific to Eileen. And nobody came along and said, here Eileen, here's a dog, or oh, you need a dog. You know, she believed that she could, she did the research, she believed that she could get a dog who could help her specifically and took steps in order to do it. And it's made an enormous difference to her life and her independence. So it's just one of the many ways in which she's, um, she's been very good at, um, I mean, she, has a, she does have a very good network. A lot of people with disabilities could benefit from having a service dog, but don't necessarily know how that would fit into their lives. And teaching people about options and choices is important. And he's an amazing choice for me. The differences are night and day. I've seen many people with chronic illnesses that have no support system. You know, being born into a family that is so large is an inherent kind of gift if those people are available for you. The time period of when I was young, having my mother believe me, to having lots of family members to take me places when I needed to go to the hospital, having people be around when my brother died and all that emotional support to meeting a man who's completely supportive of me no matter what my body does to betray me. He, you know, he, I met my husband 
and I was living on the machine at the time. I was in graduate school and I told him after our first date that I had this pretty serious chronic illness and I had to go to the hospital two to three times a week. And for some reason he just didn't go running. I'm still not 100% sure why he didn't, but he didn't. And that's a huge gift to have that support. We met in 2002, we dated for a year, then we got engaged, um, then we got married in April of 2004. As soon as we were married and things had settled back down, he said, okay, go back to school and finish your dissertation. And he's been such a wonderful, wonderful gift for her and she for him. It has been the most wonderful miracle that, you know, she was able to meet somebody so loving and so loyal and so bright. You know, for us, for the other guys that she dated, this was the first guy that was smarter than her. <laughs> when she feels really good, she wants to try to do everything she can. And she has a hard time relaxing and enjoying those times at, at times. And it's hard, you know, getting her to sit still and enjoy the fact that she's pain free or something along those lines. I think the thing that amazes me about Eileen, I guess, is that I tell people, you know, that I work for this woman who's a friend of mine and she has this disease and they always say, Oh, like poor poor Eileen, like and I'm like, Oh no, she got her PhD and she got married. got a degree in organizational psychology, so she has that, but they don't teach you, there's no course anywhere that teaches you about how to get, you know, apply for disability and how to, how to do it. Um, from my understanding, it's very difficult to do, and most people get denied the first time. They're expected to apply a couple more times before they come and get it. And it's just a, a bureaucratic procedure that people have to go through that, uh, you know, there's no course that teaches you how to do it, and you do it for yourself, and you're rarely involved with anyone else ever doing it. My specialty, my focus during my researching was on women with disabilities and disabilities as they intersect with organizations. Because I have been undiagnosed, I have been misdiagnosed, I've been diagnosed with a rare illness, those things have taught me personal lessons that I feel like I can share with other people that are patients, wanting to return to work or who are working with disabilities. I'm excited. I think I have a lot to offer. I worry about managing my health and going back to work, but I'm setting things up so that I'm a consultant, so that I am my own boss. I take on clients during the time periods when I'm able to, and it'll be a learning curve. Even when she has a very difficult issue. Let's say two months ago she had some skin issues and they to me looked very painful. And Eileen says, yeah, it was tough, it was tough and she takes care of it, goes on. You know, every time I've seen her going to the doctor, she it seems like if she has things she needs to talk about, she has it all written down and it's ready ahead of time to do that. And um, is not afraid to ask questions in, in with the medical community and so I think those are the kinds of things that people don't do, is that they, they, they wait for the medical community to give them information as opposed to being proactive and getting the information and then using it to ask good questions and see what they need to do. So I, I think I think it's really a really perfect example of somebody who advocates for herself. It's critical. It's life-saving to be your own advocate. I truly, truly believe that had I not had the emotional and unequivocal mental support from my mother that I would not physically be here alive. A lot of times I think we remember emotional situations. I mean, that, that, for me that's true. And there, there have been so many situations where I was so confused by what happened or, and so hurt that, um, that Eileen hurt so badly and I couldn't do anything about it. I learned that I was good as who I am, no matter what my body did from my mother. And she always believed me, and that has carried me through. And now 
I just believe myself. I don't necessarily have to go to her for that validation. It's become part of who I am. I can't, I can't be her, you know? I can't understand the level of pain that she has, or how she gets through a day. I can't understand, you know, what I don't have the medical knowledge to evaluate the situation. So fairly early, you know, high school and college, I was saying, what do you think? I don't know. I think that's B strength, is it? She may not understand what's going on, or she may not um, totally want to know all of the ins and outs of the disease, but she's like, bottom line is I'm there for you. So I think that's, that's, that's the strength between them. What I've learned is that I have to be that person. Nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else knows how I feel. And the kind of illness that I have is invisible. You can't see it. So a hidden or an invisible illness is even harder for the doctors to understand because they can't see it. So the only person that's going to be able to tell them is me.